sake of time, we'll get going. And if we could just get everybody to uh, come back to a single conversation in the room. If I could get everybody's attention, please. Okay. Asking for your attention, please. Thank you so much. We are very privileged today to have a, another pre presentation and guest from the city of Burnaby. Erica Lay is the climate manager of, uh, or the manager of climate action and energy at the city of Burnaby. I, I've had the chance to work with Erica before on the Burnaby uh, Zero Emissions Retrofit Task Force and, and a few other projects. Uh, Erica comes to the city of Burnaby by way of uh, SFU, where she was the, the, the lead for the sustainability program at SFU prior to coming to Burnaby. And she, she leads uh, what I've heard her describe as a small but mighty team that's really trying to champion a, a huge transition, transition uh, within Burnaby to become uh, uh, zero emissions or net zero emissions by the year 2050, which is no small task. And so, so a lot of kudos to, to Erica and the, the, um, the, the leadership that she brings in her work. And really excited to hear from her about the city's priorities and what's currently happening uh, for climate action within the city of Burnaby. So please, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it is working. Okay, so I was debating whether to stand up here, which now seems very <laughs> far up here. <laughs> but when I'm down there, I can't see all of you. So <laughs> um, thanks so much, Robin. It's it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, we've been talking about the Urban Resilient Futures Community uh, Assembly for probably close to two and a half years now. So it's pretty neat to uh, to see it come to fruition. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge uh, that we're, we're gathered on the um, unceded and traditional territories of the Halkamunum and Squamish speaking peoples, the, the um, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam nations. Um, and it's a privilege to, to be able to, to meet on these lands and, and to, to speak about really um, uh, what our cities look like in the past and, and really how we want to think about that in the future. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about climate change in Burnaby um, and how we can think about it in the context of the official community plan. Oh, now I have to, I have to do two different hand things. <laughs> um, so the first thing I just wanted to, to talk about from the very beginning was um, kind of two interlocking concepts. So the first one is climate change mitigation, and that's how uh, reducing climate changing um, emission, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so a lot of our climate, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, a lot of our uh, climate action framework, which we'll talk about later, is really focused on climate change mitigation. And then climate change adaptation and resilience is about strengthening our ability to anticipate, reduce, and manage. Uh, climate risks. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is kind of seed a few different pieces to think about in terms of climate change so that as you enter these next steps in the, the community assembly, um, you have some things to think about. So some of the pieces or some examples when you're thinking about uh, mitigation and adaptation um, are how we reduce our emissions, so that's the mitigation part, um, and then how uh, we adapt or, and prepare our communities. In 2019, the city of Burnaby declared a climate emergency um, and set science-based targets uh, mirroring those from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and a whole bunch of other uh, peers that we have across uh, the, the region and uh, globally. Um, the part of this declaration was really the recognition um, that in order to achieve these really aggressive targets to keep uh, our global climate change under one, one and a half degrees, um, there needs to be coordinated approach across all order of orders of government. And it doesn't just take government, it, but it takes industry, it takes businesses, and it takes our communities to actually get us there. So in that declaration of a climate emergency, um, Burnaby set out the targets to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as a community, as a whole, um, by 45% by 2030, so just uh, six years from now, uh, by 75% by 2040, and to, to reach carbon neutrality uh, by 2050. So I'm going to jump from that, that idea of like what we're emitting to what we might anticipate to see in our region around climate change. Um, and 
we're seeing we're seeing uh, a changing climate already. We you know here in BC we we know about these record breaking wildfire seasons. Um, we've had record breaking temperatures globally um, for for months and months in a row now. Um, and uh, part of understanding how we can prepare in our prepare ourselves is understanding what that might look like in the future. Um, so this is a really great uh, infographic from. Um, uh, from Retooling for Climate Change, um, which is a provincial um, initiative, and it talks a little bit about some of the things we might see. So what we can expect here in Burnaby um, and in the south coast um, are longer dry spells and less summer rain. So the February snowpack um, uh, analysis showed that we have 41% of our snowpack um, uh, right now. It's, you know, we've there's snow on the North Shore Mountains today, but that only showed up yesterday. Um, and if we have 41% of our snowpack now, um, what that means in the, sum the spring and the summer is that we're going to have um, less water in our reservoirs. Um, our snowpack is kind of like our water battery. Um, we're going to see um, less summer rain, um, more water, and that'll lead to more water use restrictions. Um, we'll probably see an increase in uh, risk of wildfires and uh, increased risk to fish and wildlife as well. Um, we're also really going to see uh, the other side of that is seeing the warmer, wetter winters. And part of that is, like I was talking about, the less snowpack, because less of it's um, coming down as snow and more of it's coming down as rain. Um, and then, but that also means increased uh, risk of neighborhood overland flooding, because we might ha we'll have um, bigger, um, more frequent big rain events, big precipitation events. Um, and, it, and those things can, can increase our risk of landslides or um, can put, uh, if we're looking around our neighborhoods, can put stress on our drainage systems. Um, and they can also kind of have an impact on some of our local winter recreation or tourism and, and some of those other uh, industry pieces that we might think about. Um, I'm realizing as I'm saying this out loud, I sometimes I forget Sometimes it's, it sounds a little bit doom and gloom um, in terms of climate change, but I think that there's there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of hope and possibility to, to talk about. So we'll get into that as well. So hold hold though that feeling that it's not exclusively doom and gloom. Um, um, the other thing that um, Robin and the SFU team asked us to talk about a little bit was um, if we are seeing climate change, who might be more vulnerable to climate change. Um, so Vancouver Coastal Health and, and the Fraser Health Authority, so our two health authorities in the region, um, did a great um, health, climate change, and, and health vulnerability and capacity assessment. And so the big piece around climate change is the existing inequities that we see in our communities right now. We're going to see the same same lines, kind of same, same ways that our communities are cleaved um, and there's inequity there. Those are, those are the same lines where we're going to see people more impacted by climate change. Um, so this can range from uh, pregnant women and children, and this is for physiological reasons. Uh, the, and actually, most, most of these examples are all physiological and health-based health reasons. Um, uh, the elderly, um, folks who are unhoused or resource-deprived, um, people who are socially isolated, um, people who have pre-existing health issues, or people who are systematically marginalized. And part of this has to do with um, kind of thinking about, one, are how sensitive are people to, to climate change? So if you have pre-existing um, uh, uh, respiratory illness, if, you, if we um, add things like regular wildfire seasons um, into there, that's going to make it harder to breathe breathe. Um, part of it is about exposure. So if you work outside a lot um, during periods where there's a heat, heat dome or extended dry periods, that's also going to make you more at risk um, to the impacts of, of that of a change in climate. Um, and then the other piece that I was talking about a little bit before is about this, this about adaptive capacity. So the more resources that each of us has the ability to draw on, the more we can kind of, you know, um, Deek around these changes, um, uh, go out and buy a, a, a fan when it's really hot, um, that, that sort of thing. So if you have 
um, less adaptive capacity and resources at your fingertips. And that can also mean the communities that you're connected to. Um, that can also um, make you a little bit more um, susceptible to climate change. What they're really getting ready for is now I'm going to just hit you with a bunch of graphs. So <laughs> this is your respite before the graphs. <laughs> Um, or you can get ready to nerd out. Um, so we're, we're going to shift a little bit from the climate change adaptation side of things and how we, we might be impacted by climate change or the projected changes in the climate um, in Burnaby in the Metro Vancouver region. Um, and then we're going to actually move to sources of emissions. So uh, the ch climate is changing. We've already w hit 1.4 degrees um, Oh, yeah, this, this will provide a link to you guys um, um, through Robin, but this is a really great um, uh, infographic of all of those um, components of a healthy, low-carbon, and climate-resilient community that was put together by Vancouver Coastal Health and, and, um, and the Fraser Health Authority. So um, I'll maybe, we'll, ju we'll jump into the other pieces because I know I don't, don't have too much time, um, but we'll make sure that you have access to this or we'll will uh, provide you with that link if you want to dig into this more. Um, okay, promise some graphs. So, so one of the things that we can do is go, okay, the cl climate is changing. We hit 1.4 degrees um, last uh, th this fall. Um, Canada is changing at twice as, twice as fast as a global rate, um, but there are some things we can do. So one of them is thinking about um, this, this concept of uh, climate change mitigation. So how do we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in our day-to-day -day lives? And that's deeply linked to what you were talking about earlier today and about how we design our cities um, and, and, uh, and deliver resources. So when we look at the emissions inventory for uh, the city of Burnaby, um, what you can see here is that there's two really big chunks, and those are buildings and transportation. Then we have a little little slice there is the waste, and then the rest is other, which is a whole grab bag of um, special pieces. So this is a, this just um, in case there's uh, really big climate nerds out there, um, this is a territorial emissions um, uh, inventory. So that means it's emissions that are associated with uh, the burning of fossil fuels in, in our communities, but doesn't account for everything that we consume. So the things that we wear, the things that, we, that are made outside of, of the city of Burnaby, those aren't counted in this set of emissions. Um, so that's another place we can think about this. Um, so understanding our emission sources was really important for us as a city to, to go, okay, well then, what are our biggest emission sources and what are what are the things that we as a city can do to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so um, when we were developing the city's climate um, action framework, which is kind of our strategy, our, our path forward to reduce emissions and, and um, uh, put in policies or incentives and, and supports in place to for our community as a whole to reduce our emissions, um, we modeled out what some of the actions that, that uh, municipalities can do um, and how we would get from that um, I should explain more about this graph. So first of all, it has our uh, reduction targets in here, um, but it also has this big bite. And that's, as we're going from now to 2050, this is the, the chunk that we have of emissions that we have to get rid of. So that's important if you look at kind of, this is business as usual if we just continued along um, with our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and then this big bite is what we want to tackle with our climate action framework. So then, when we look at this, this is how we're this is how we're going to eat this elephant bite by bite, um, in the words of Desmond Tutu. Um, so th this is where we modeled out what are the types of actions we can take, what are the policies we can put in place as a, as a municipality, and how those would contribute to eating that elephant. Not that I support eating elephants, but <laughs> um, ta tackling this, this big issue. Um, so you can see that there's a, a range of different pieces in here, and most of them are blue and green because they're dealing with transportation and they're dealing with buildings, our biggest sources of emissions. 
So what this led to with, for the city was uh, the development of the Climate Action Framework. Um, the Climate Action Framework has seven big moves, and these are focused on not only systems pieces, so thinking about climate leadership, resilient neighborhoods, and how all of this stuff fits together to contribute to re reduced climate um, impacts, but, and healthy ecosystems to the same, but then also has um, two uh, big moves for those, those really big sources of emissions, so two for uh, transportation and two for buildings. Um, and so I just want to remind you again of this idea of reducing our emissions and then preparing to adapt our communities. Um, can I do a, a quick time check? Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Robin. Um, so what I just thought I'd do is just touch a little bit on what some of those pieces are, what our first quick starts were in the climate action framework for each of those big moves. Um, there's, there's lots of text on here, but mostly I just wanted to speak to, when you say climate leadership, what does that mean? When you say zero emission buildings, what does that mean? Uh, again, to get you thinking um, in terms of next steps. So uh, in terms of climate leadership, this is about um, getting our house in order so that we have a climate action team. So I joined the, the city about three years ago, and before that we, we had people working diligently on this and thinking about it, but we didn't have a climate action team. So that means we can uh, spend dedicated time to, to work on our climate action framework and, and implement this. Um, it also includes expanding climate engagement and awareness um, and advocating for climate action because we sit nested within other other tools and levers that we have at the provincial level and at the, at the federal level and um, in the region as part of Metro Vancouver. The second, the second big move is around resilient communities. So a big piece and a big, really big opportunity. The, the, in our in our, um, in our office, we've, we're talking a lot about the OCP, the official community plan, and the fact that this is. In, until recently, this was like a once in a career kind of opportunity because what we're doing with the OCP is going, where do we want to go? How do we want to design this, our city and, and articulate our values um, and, and have our municipality talk about this? So um, the, a big piece of the resilient communities, big move is being able to integrate the, idea, the ideas of climate change, uh, well, not changing the climate, but climate action and climate resilience right into the official community plan. So you guys being here today is one, one way where we can um, fold those pieces in. Um, I, healthy ecosystems are pretty crucial, um, if you can go to the, that link. So I thought I would just show you this pretty illustrative um, uh, version of our uh, map of the city of Burnaby and the land surface temperatures on uh, June 21st, 2021, uh, or sorry, June, June 30th, 2021, which was the heat dome in 2021. So on the left-hand side, you have the, uh, the um, canopy cover, and on the right-hand side, you have the land surface temperatures. So if you don't mind sliding that uh, line across, so canopy cover is where there's trees, or sorry, it's paved surface. So um, uh, roads and parking lots. So as, as we start to slide this across, if you just kind of gently slide it, what you'll see base, basically is the places where um, we have the least paved surface are the places that were coolest in the city. So when we're thinking about our systems, um, we want to think, think about it as a landscape as a whole, and, uh, and how we are designing our city will help us to adapt to those, um, those uh, anticipated climate change, the uh, changes in the climate. Thank you. So the healthy ecosystem um, big move is about uh, making sure that our ecosystem is healthy because uh, it supports us in, in adapting um, to climate change. Um, we have two transportation big moves, and I'm going to uh, swing through these pretty quickly. One is about mode shift, so changing how we get around um, and ideally out of single occupancy vehicles when we can. Um, the next one is on uh, the adoption of electric vehicles if, if a vehicle is something that you need to use. 
Um, and then we have two um, big moves on zero emission buildings. So one is about as we add new buildings to our city, as we grow and change, um, building new buildings that are uh, low emission. And then also thinking about how we can kind of future-proof our existing buildings. So uh, often the most sustainable building is the one we've already got. Um, so you can retrofit, retrofitting your um, homes and the, the existing buildings uh, can make us better equipped to um, weather those, uh, the changing climate, so the heat domes or the um, increase in um, precipitation events. Um, and they're also an opportunity to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I just wanted to finish on this, this big piece because the, the whole point of the, the climate action declaration in 2019 by the city was a recognition that we can't do this alone. Um, and so as we embark on this as a municipality, um, it's also so, so it's impossible to do if we don't work uh, together. Thanks. Thanks very much, Erica. And we're going to take a couple questions. All right, there we go. Um, you talked about the emission sources, um, like in the footprint of, of Burnaby, but what about the industry that it's already here? Because I see that most of the actions are based on transportation and like bring, um, the green canopy and everything. But yeah, what about the industries? That's a great question. So the tools that we have as a municipality um, are maybe limited in terms of some of the, some of the ways that we can look at, at land use planning for industry. Um, so we look to, for example, um, uh, the, the provincial government, the federal government, and even the, our um, regional government, Metro Vancouver, to deal with uh, air quality issues. So uh, there's, there's some pieces we can think about in terms of how we think about our land use planning um, in, this, in this OCP um, to, to address what kind of industries we might um, uh, want to encourage or, or deter in the city, but uh, we, don't we, it's, we don't have as many, the tools that we have lie more in the planning side of things than our climate action strategy. Other questions? All right. Hi. So in that chart um, with the CO2 emission decrease, um, I think like 2017, it was somewhere around 1.5 million. And then um, by 2030, we want to be somewhere below 1 million. So it's 2024. I'm just wondering where we are right now. Uh, yep, I, I, I knew we'd have that question. So I would say we're, we're, um, we've reduced emissions by about probably about 15% since 2010. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of work to do. Um, this is, uh, we're seeing similar rates of change for our neighboring cities um, that have just released their, their, uh, their updates. Um, but yeah, the, the, the very steep slope that you see there um, requires a, uh, a lot of bold moves. I think, you, no, Joel, you didn't have a question? Okay, Joseph. Uh, so we're to reduce emissions while growing by one third in population. That seems like a double whammy. Yes. <laughs> Do you have a question? <laughs> so I guess, of course, the idea is as you grow more people, more people means more emissions. Um, my question then would be how do we grow or in what ways um, do we grow to actually reduce emissions cumulatively, not just on a per capita basis as we grow by that amount, because we need to reduce total emissions, not just per person as we grow. And of course, cities are good at reducing per capita, so you get more people together, but yeah, reducing that overall then as well. Yeah, and so I, I think I heard someone talking about silver bullets before, there's definitely no silver bullets in climate change. It's Some people have talked about silver buckshot, um, but I, I would love to find that too. So it's it's going to be incremental changes on, on a whole number of fronts. So when we talk about, um, uh, when we go back to the graph around all of the different, uh, all of the different slices that we're going to have to 
would have to take. It's really, um, you know, reducing our uh, internal combustion engines and, and the use of single occupancy vehicles or burning fossil fuels to get around. Uh, the same goes for our, our existing buildings. Um, so, you know, I, th I think we have a really great panel coming up that's, that speaks to a number of the different um, solutions that, that we can uh, tackle, use to tackle this. Okay, we're going to do one or two more questions. I, I do want to acknowledge that we have some, some guests in the room, who, and we're just running maybe about 10 minutes behind schedule. So I'll, be, I'll beg their, um, uh, their patience as we, we finish off uh, this climate change conversation. Um, so, so just, but yes, just uh, while we're here, I'll acknowledge that we have Andy Ann, we have Paul Holden, and we have, I believe, Graham Kavanaugh, yes, uh, has arrived. And, and thank you very much for, for coming and uh, thank you for your patience as we finish off. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Hello, my name's Avalon. Um, obviously, I'm a big advocate of the land back movement. Obviously, we can't like give, go municipality by municipality giving the land back, but the next best thing would be to incorporate as much um, indigenous wisdom into our plans as pos and policies as possible. And I was wondering what steps is uh, the municipality taking to uh, engage um, uh, the indigenous people on what they think would be best, what they would like to see, what changes they would want us to do. Um, is there any of that happening and can we increase it? Great question. So I think I'll, ju I'll just hit on one example. So um, on the horizon is the development of the, the climate change adaptation and resilience strategy. And that is a, is a key place where we intend to engage with our, the host nations. Um, because there's, lot, there's lots of knowledge to understand uh, the pre-existing um, um, uh, ecosystem and uh, wisdom around adaptation and, and risk mitigation um, from multiple different lenses. Uh, Avalon, I might suggest uh, uh, asking that question again next time when we have Erin Rennie back here, um, who, who will have some, some ideas as well. In regarding the projection and impacting this slide, there are some impacting is for due to rain is going to be less as a projection you have mentioned there. But the impacting us also will impact the source of the water and shortage of water. I think that item is missing in your slide. That, that's a very good point. Yeah, so when we talk about um, uh, the decrease in the snowpack, that means our reservoirs um, will be less full and those batteries will be less charged uh, for access to, our, access to our water in the future. Thank you. Okay, if this works for folks, I think what we're gonna do is pause now. We're gonna take a 10 minute break, so, so a second 10 minute break this afternoon. Just to quickly grab any, any snacks that you want, any coffee. Um, please though, let's keep it down to 10 minutes and that way we'll plan to start um, the, the panel at about seven after three, okay? All right, thank you very much to Erica. Let's give a round of applause to Erica. <laughs> who will be also staying around for the panel, so we'll hear more. <laughs>